and welcome to another exciting hair raising fun filled expeditious episode of Radio Rama where I show you how to primarily work on radios radio based electronics basically most things that run on vacuum tubes and um, today we have a Emerson model 778 in a black plastic case it's not Bakelite I think it's Plascon P-L-A-S-K-O-N it, um, I wasn't able to find a year on it because I'm too lazy to spend a lot of time researching it. It's got the civil defense markings on it, so it's post-1955. I'd probably put it about there, maybe a little afterwards. Um, condition, as far as working, is unknown. It appears to have had a lot of use. The, the enamel is worn off of these knobs. It doesn't look very good either. I need to uh, think about what I'm going to do there. I might just strip the paint off and leave them black or find another color to paint them. So let's go ahead and give it a test fire. Well, that's not the on-off button. That's the station changer. Looks like the pilot light is, is working. It's very dim. I'm not sure what pilot lights that are used for. I guess to make sure you know the radio's on. Okay. That noise is very, very common when it comes to these sets. That is the sound of the filter capacitors having gone the way of the dodo bird. They are shot and they need to be replaced. And so that means I need to take this radio out of the case and do some investigating. And that means removing these three little bolts here. Looks like what's left of the label shows me it's just a very typical All-American 5. We have a 35W4 for the rectifier, 50C5 for the output, and the 12BA6 and 12BA7 for our IF related type cans. And here we go, and boy is this a... well that's not good. I need to take this off and restructure it a little bit, this antenna. What an odd chassis design. What do we got going on underneath here anyway? Not much. There's remarkably little going on in this thing. We have our big electrolytic capacitor there with two values, a 30 and a 50 microfarad cap. And there's a bunch of caps underneath it. This is this is gonna be a challenge because it's so deep down in there. Just getting down in there is gonna be not that much fun. But I do wanna take this back off and uh, do some reinforcing of it so it's not gonna be all flopping around when it's put back in the case. But very typical, very typical uh, chassis, well, uh, Chassis design is not typical, but it's interesting they put the tuning condenser inside the chassis. I don't think I've seen that very often. Look at that, that dial string. I'm glad it's not broken because figuring that out would be all kinds of fun. Very curious, weird design. In fact, yeah, that's fascinating. It's, that's mechanical ingenuity going on there. And I'll tell you one thing, I've, I'm encountering a problem with this radio that I've never encountered before on a AA5, which I can't get to these parts. And I think what they've done here is they probably put the parts in and then they put this back on. Because this, this comes off. And annoyingly, what they've done is they soldered this tab. And there's just two little bolts to hold the rest together. Bottom line, I'm about to get I'm about to get that back off where I can service it. It's just not gonna work unless I do that. 
What an aggravating design. This is certainly a curious radio. I wound up desoldering the tab that was on the side. And when I removed those two <clears throat> screws, that whole two sides of the chassis came off. So now I have easy access to this. And um, the first things I always do when I start working on these guys is look for the grounding cap. It took a while because this is so weird. It's this guy, this tenth of a microfarad. That value is way too high. It's a good way to get yourself a jolt if you touch the wrong thing. Anyway, I'm going to replace these two electrolytics. I already cut it out of here. We have a red one, a red lead for 30, green one for 50, and this is a common ground for both of them. It's a real challenge. There's not much room to work in here. In fact, I think I'll replace these two guys first to make more room because the replacements will be a lot smaller, and then I'll have more room to work with putting the new electrolytics in. All right, so I've replaced both the electrolytics and a few associated caps. This cord is also pretty stiff, so I need to replace that. Once they start getting stiff like that, you should do it. Because if this is going to go back into service for who knows how long, X number of possible decades, that cord is just going to get worse. Go ahead and replace it. So I've got it plugged into my isolation transformer, which is that weird buzzing noise. And we'll give it a test fire. First, I can tell that pilot lamp is out completely. Yeah, whatever an idea is taken to Kyle from Mike McDaniel, I think Mike probably has a really strong... San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, service of Salem Media Group. You know, he wouldn't be taken... Limited seating, unlimited protection. Mike's working pretty good. So I just need to replace the rest of these caps, including the grounding cap. And as I always mention in my videos, you should use a safety cap. This is an X2, Y2, across the line, 0 0.01 microfarad rated safety cap. So think of it as like this has one end of the incoming AC plug coming through it. So with that low capacitance level, we're suppressing the amount of potential current that could get to that chassis meaning the shock hazard gets taken down by a factor of, well, in this case, 10 uh, from the original tenth of a microfarad rated cap. I'm also going to replace the pilot light, of course. It's not good to run the sets without the pilot light because sometimes, actually, I don't know if it's, that's the case on this particular set, but some sets, they tie into the output tube, and if you let it go, you know, with a burned-out pilot light for too long, it can stress out the output tube. I don't think that's the case with this set. But, um, so we got two more of these caps to replace, replace the uh, pilot lamp, and uh, do some lubrication of the bearings. I want to do all the stuff I can while I have these side panels off, because if I have to do anything, in fact, I'll probably put those on at the very last, because um, if there's anything else I need to do, I don't want to have to desolder it again. All right, we got it fully recapped here with our safety cap installed, and I put a new pilot light in. And it still seems to work pretty well. Across the uh, the Pro Bowl for a couple of plays oh, yesterday, I and I know it's it was worse than I ever remembered it. Uh, it, it the black and the dot. Yeah, they went away. Pretty sensitive, I must say, for such a basic design. I'd be curious how reception is affected by having that inside amongst all the coils and underneath the IF and RF transformers. Probably not a whole hell of a lot of a difference, otherwise it wouldn't work. But anyway, one can always wonder. I did put a new cord on it. Actually, it's a used cord. Anytime I'm walking around the neighborhood or driving around, if someone throws appliances or lamps away, I always nab the cords off of them because it's cheaper than going to the hardware store. So, electrically, we're in good shape. I think I'm going to maybe call it a wrap for today. I kind of had a busy weekend and a busy day at work. So we'll resume this mañana. Boy, I got my camera dirty. All right, welcome back to day number two, working on the Emerson. And, as noted from yesterday, I completed the restoration of the overall chassis electrically. 
Last thing I'm going to do is add the oh so famous audio input feature that I always add. And that means adding an audio input that goes through the volume control. And I'm going to do so by going through this isolation transformer. And I, you know, I say isolation transformer, all it really is, it's just a transformer that can basically you put 120 volts in and 12 volts comes out the other side. 220 in and 24 volts out would probably do just fine. We find that this ratio works better uh, for some reason after trial and error. I buy these from Alibaba. But if you're only going to do a couple radios, if you just go around and empty your drawers of all the crappy little wall warts you have, if you have one that does 120 and 12 volts out or something like that, it does exactly the same thing. Now, due to the fact that this is such a weird chassis, and I don't have a lot of room inside of here, and I don't trust some of these flimsy sidewalls, I'm actually going to mount that transformer right here. Now, obviously, I need to clean the filth off of this. I usually do that anyway, just because it's satisfactory to know that your chassis is clean. It won't stink from the smell of burning hot dust from the tubes. Now, the other challenge is that I can't really get to the other side of this pot very easily. It looks like the way that it works is that it goes through this wafer type thing. Probably one of these, probably one of the components in this wafer is probably a capacitor. And then that goes to one of the IF transformers. First IF is probably, well, the second IF is probably here. You can, usually what I'll do is um, the lead that's marked green is usually where the signal comes out. It's either one of these transformers, this one right here. I just have to measure the voltage. You don't want to attach it to one of the leads that has a lot of voltage on it. But I get a feeling that's it. I know it's hard to film. I need to get a better camera or something. But I'm going to do a test here. I'm going to snip the lead right there. See if that kills the radio signal. And then we'll add a switch wire that comes off of that so that we have the ability to turn radio signal on and off so that when someone wants to listen to the radio, they can versus listening to their music. I get a feeling most people that get these things from us, they don't listen to AM. There's like nothing to listen to on AM around here at least. It's just like sports. I mean, if you're a sports fan, most people are. I'm not. Great. There's also a lot of talk radio, which I'm not a fan of. A lot of religious stuff. I'm not particularly religious. So if you're like me, not a lot of offerings on AM. So this gives you the ability to listen to other things. All right, so I snipped, just snipped that little wire there. And that's what the volume turned all the way up. Now, the other thing I want to make sure is if I attach a lead to that, is that going to create... basically an, an antenna. Probably the sound of my isolation transformer leaking through that buzzing noise. But I think, I think we're on the money there. That's, that's the way to go right there. Well, let me just show you guys what I've been idiotically, f I don't know, f thrashing around about. Usually, the first connection off the IF can disconnects a radio signal really cleanly. But I found that instead, the, uh, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, the last pin on 12AV6, I think that's what that is. That's what that looks like, or 12AT6, it's one of those. That truly really disconnects the IF signal. It took me about 30 minutes to figure that out. Of course, I could have stopped being lazy and gone inside and printed a schematic, but <laughs> that'd be too easy. But anyway, I've got this clipped out of here. Our switch will go in here between these two. And I did fold this down. I was like, I can't work in here. If I ever see one of these again, I swear to God, I'll 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 pass it up. I'll let someone else deal with it because this this is such a pain in the ass. You have to like flay out the entire damn chassis just to get at it. All right, so we've got the first part of the system installed. Isolation transformer. We have two resistors that'll tie the right and left channels together. 
We have a .02 rated cap and a resistor that's half the value of the volume pot. That's going to go in through here and go to the top of the volume pot where the IF signal comes in. I had to be a little creative this time because I don't really have a means to tie the audio cord that comes in to anything. So I had to drill a hole through here. I'm waiting for my glue gun to warm up and then I will fill that hole with a gob of glue and press that in. And that way there'll be no chafing, chafing or whatever you say. Now, the other thing that I need to do is oil some of these pivot joints here so things will move a lot more smoothly. And you don't want to get it on the cord. You get it on the cord, you're, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Everything's going to slip. So, just put it on the areas that move. And just work it in. Like so. Probably also lubricate the bearings that are in the tuning condenser. This is one I need at one of those rotisserie things that people talk about because this is this is just a mess. And welcome to day number two of working on the Emerson. And um, I have to make a confession that I kind of made an idiotic mistake yesterday. Long story short, there were three connections going to top side of the volume pot. When I disconnected all those, that gave me a cleaner signal for my incoming audio and a way to switch the IF signal so that it's um, much more satisfactory. The other thing is that I did a safety test last night. So the last thing I did, the set was barely failing. And I've noticed that it had a really loud hum. And so I thought, well, that sounds to me like it could be a tube that is partially shorted. And when it comes to mind, a shorting tube is either the output or the rect rectifier, which gets hit the hardest. Because this was, my threshold is 0.6 on the scale, even though this is not filming very well. That probably looks really funny. But it was getting, it was not really passing. It was probably 0.63 or 4, which is probably still doable, but it didn't make me feel comfortable. With the replaced rectifier, we're getting 0.5859. It's on the it's on the bleeding edge, but it passes. So now it's time to um, start putting this back together again. I'm gonna have to do a lot of cleaning on the on the case. The case is is just kind of filthy and I'm gonna have to be careful because it's got this I don't know, this grill fabric in it. I could probably remove it. There's these little speed clips or friction clips that hold it in. I can hear my ancient cat making noise in here. Peanut. Never mind, it's George. All right, George, you can't come out here. <laughs> George is female, by the way. We didn't realize that George was female until we'd had her for a while and took her to the vet. Anyway, I'm going to bring this back over here and start reassembling the weird chassis, putting all the sides back on. All right, so I got the chassis all back together, and actually, I decided to improve upon their design. I actually soldered a lot of the corners so that it's more structurally rigid than it was when it came from the factory. So now that I've got that done, it's time to move on to the cabinet. And as previously noted, there's a bunch of grill cloth that's in here. And it's cardboard backed. And if I'm going to clean this, trying to get into all these little intricate nooks and crannies, that's not easy with that grill cloth there. Plus, I'd probably make the grill cloth look crap, like crap. So me while I reposition things. I'm going to have to come in here and remove these little clips. The way you do it is you want to lift up on these little edges here. I'm not sure if I can film this. I'm going to at least try to do one of these. There we go. Just lift up one end of it. And that should should there we go pull right out do that for all four sides what you do with these is you 
hammer them flat with a hammer when you put them back in. All right, so I got that removed. So now I can take it over to the sink and clean it. Plascon is different than Bakelite. It's not porous with uh, Bakelite if you were to do what I'm about to do. You'd ruin the surface, but Plascon is not absorbent. I'm going to get some um, simple green and I keep a few old paintbrushes around. And I just go in and really scrub all these little nooks and crannies. And then we'll dry it and then we'll proceed to use some plastic polish to bring back the original shine. All right, well, I'm not sure if this is Plascon. It sure doesn't look like Bakelite, but whatever it was, when I brought it out from being cleaned, it was a dull, dulled up. So I'm going to try something I've never done before. This may end in failure. I decided to put this tire shine on it. It's got probably silicones or something in it. Whatever's in it, it stuff smells like... I don't know what that smell is supposed to be. It smells like bananas and cherries mixed together. Maybe it's supposed to make you feel happy about spraying your tires. I don't know. But I'm going to wipe this off, and then we're going to go over it with old-fashioned Carnuba Car Wax, and then maybe some Novus Number 2. We'll see. All right, well, I got the uh, first coat of wax on there, and whenever I run into a real complicated grill like this, it has 5,000 little things to get wax stuck in, that's when I get out the good old-fashioned shoe brush. Works on shoes, it also works on radios. So you can come in here and just like scrub and get all the wax out of those annoying little places. And you can go over it with a, a rag to bring out the buff. This makes life a lot easier instead of going in there with a toothbrush and Q-tips or whatever. I figured I just had to show this. This is my main coon cat. Very large breed of cat and he likes for me to turn the shower on in the morning for him. We're going to have at it. Anyway, for those that don't know, Maine Coons can get up to, oh, 30 pounds. Anyway, there you go. Back to radios. All right, welcome to the last day of working on the Emerson. And I had to spend quite a bit of time getting this case to to bring it back to get some shine to it. Last thing is the knobs. The there's too much paint worn off of it. I don't have any gold paint. Whatever color that is supposed to be. And the, the dial looks fine. So I think the next best thing is just to remove the paint. I don't have brown bake light knobs. It'll look perfectly fine. I soaked them overnight in a little bit of uh ammonia and hot water. That usually does the trick when it comes to really old paint that's been handled by hands and all the grease kind of like messes up the paint. That didn't work. So I'm going to put them in there and put a little paint stripper on it. And probably by the time I get this fully assembled and put back together, the knobs will be good to put back on it as well. So again, it's assembly time. All right, so chassis is done final assembly. This little blue thing is a switch. It disconnects the... Uh, radio signal and I've got a little Bluetoothy thing running through it right now All right. it's kind of a rocking little unit um, I have a little bit of dust money still in the tuning condenser so I need to clean that up I'm also going to put a little glue over the top of this just to make sure if that ever comes loose it's not going to hit anything, which I don't think it will. And uh, put it back in the case, and hopefully she'll be done. By the way, we're having the weirdest freaking weather right now. It's like 75 degrees or something. It's like early February. We ain't getting the rain here in California. We're in a pretty serious drought, so I'm imagining we're not going to be able to wash the cars pretty soon. All right, so it's all back together again. And I have a confession to make. Even though I only left the knobs in the stripper for about five minutes, it did not agree with whatever that plastic is. It melted the plastic on that knob. So I looked at my collection and I found these knobs that have gold centers. 
which I think actually looks pretty good. Um, we have like 10,000 knobs at the museum, so maybe I'll see if we have anything that's even better, but I think this will do just fine. So I got my Bluetooth running through it now. Anyway, we got the uh, little switch here, so if I want to turn the radio on, I can. Not a big deal. Most people that get these things from us, they actually use them to listen to music. I don't really listen to the radio, because like I said, there's not there's crap to listen to around here. Anyway, after I get through filming this, I'll let it run for a few hours, just to make sure that nothing's going to blow up from the heat of being inside the chassis, or chassis, inside the cabinet. Because usually if you have electronics that are going to reach their max temperature, it's going to be inside of an enclosure that they came in. They usually let it do for about two hours or something like that. Anyway, this one was super frustrating, but often at the end of the day, they come out to be some of the more satisfying radios because you know what you started with and you know the, the pain and anguish that you went through. And... Uh, I think this one turned out pretty snazzy. It'll make a nice radio for somebody someday. Probably actually um, in March when we go to our next show. Our Omicron cases have collapsed here, so hopefully, hopefully, I swear to God, I hope this is the end of this damn thing. <laughs> and I hope it ends really soon wherever you live. Um, anyway, as always, I really appreciate um, you guys watching and uh, putting up with all of my shenanigans and whatnot. If you like what you see, make sure and press that like button. And uh, as always, you can leave comments or questions down in the comments section below, and I'll try to get to them. But in the meantime, until the next time something else comes across my bench, which is either going to be that Opus number 7 or the Zenith over there. See you guys next time. Adios.